I'm here today with Sandeep Roy, the author of Don't Let Him Know. Sandeep, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm very happy to be here. I am I'm actually, in, in some ways, I feel like I'm a bit of a fraud writer. It's my first book, but uh, the most of the writing I did when I first came to the U.S. as an immigrant was as a computer programmer. So I was writing computer programs. <laughs> so from that to writing novels is quite a, a jump. But I'm an engineer who came here, was you know, bitten by the writing bug, became a journalist and a radio show host in the Bay Area for public radio. I started doing commentary for national public radio while in the Bay Area. And this is my first book, uh, Don't Let Him Know, is a novel. It's set in both the US and in India. And it's a novel about family secrets. And it follows the journey of this one family, a mother, a father, and a son, and the secrets that they carry back and forth between themselves from across generations and across continents. OK, so you said you were an engineer, and then you became a journalist. So what made you switch? The clear paths. <laughs> this, is, this is the point where all the parents listening to this turn off the television and tell their children to go away somewhere because, because it's, not, it's not the very traditional career path or not the one that you know parents, Indian parents especially, encourage their children to do. I became an engineer because at that time, you know, growing up in India at that time, you, it was kind of given that if you had the ability to be a doctor or an engineer, those were solid professions that would, you know, earn, you know, stand you in good stead in life. And, uh, but I always liked to write, but writing was not really regarded as a viable profession, you know, like to support yourself or live, let alone a family. Um, so then I came to the US and I worked, you know, I had a master's in computer science and I was working in Silicon Valley and it was a very comfortable life and a, a good life. And, but I always wrote on the side. It was because something I always enjoyed doing. So it was like a hobby almost. And I would write for the Bay Area's uh, Indian media, like India Currents or India Abroad and places like that. And at one point, uh, but at one point I realized that I couldn't really see myself in five years time as still going as a software engineer and that what I really wanted to do was write and I ran into an organization called New America Media based in San Francisco which was a consortium of ethnic media outlets from across the country the like Indian outlets Chinese outlets Spanish outlets and and they gave me a chance to come on as an editor they were hosting a they were just starting a new radio show on a public radio station called KALW um, and they asked me if I wanted to try out as a host of the show so it all sort of like accidentally fell into place and I've never regretted it I mean I I've really enjoyed writing and being a journalist so what inspired you to write this book huh. <laughs> don't let him know I mean it's you know the, uh, uh, people often say like oh you're a journalist <laughs> and you wrote a book of fiction and they always are a little surprised but they feel like as journalists you might write a book on non-fiction perhaps yeah. you know the new India or something like yeah. that or Indian American diaspora but I always like telling stories and I had written pieces of this book in other forms before almost as vignettes as stories mm -hmm. um, you know I had written this story about a, a young woman who comes as the wife of a PhD student to a small town in Illinois and about her experiences there, the isolation she might feel, some of which was taken from my own experience, even though I'm not a young woman, but <laughs> I, and I didn't come as anyone's spouse, but I came to a, the very same small town, Carbondale, Illinois. <laughs> I came to Illinois as a graduate student myself, and I remember clearly that experience of, you know, coming from a bustling city like Calcutta. Yeah. to a small town like Carbondale where it was so quiet and so green I almost thought I would like choke to death because <laughs> it was just too green and it was too quiet to sleep and too green to it was so peaceful and tranquil but it was almost unnerving and and a lot of that experience became part of my character Romola's exper first experience of America coming to this country and being utterly dependent on her husband for every little thing from having to drive somewhere where she can't drive mm -hmm. and she's unable to navigate the system. 
and so many of those experiences went into the normal language so even though the book is a book of fiction mm-hmm. and the characters in it really as the film say bear no resemblance to anyone living or dead <laughs> the experiences some of the experiences that they go through are taken from life experiences that all of us have had in in sort of navigating the culture okay so you said you came from india then to the us so what were some like challenges and difficulties you've had to face going back and forth um when i first came from india to the us i think obviously there was an enormous culture shock yeah. coming to this country i mean your I, your experience of America was mediated through Hollywood in India, <laughs> yeah. which, granted, might give a only slightly more realistic <laughs> idea of America than if an American's inter- image of India in mediated Bollywood. through Bollywood. Is <laughs> that is true. Different. But at the same time, you know, you come here. I think things that were very hard to get used to was there was a much more sense of isolation. you know you were used to being in a family structure yeah. and now you were just had to fend for yourself i was a typical sort of pampered middle class boy in india who yeah. never even had to boil an egg in his life and now you were suddenly like you know you had to learn how to cook in yeah. order to fend for yourself but also i think the biggest challenge was to learn to be independent mm-hmm. in a way that you never had to in india because in india there was always someone who was who would pick up after you who would <laughs> yeah. do it but here it was you were responsible for yourself You, know, you had to you had to make sure your money your graduate student money lasted till the end of the month you had to watch your budget and and if you went out drinking you had to make sure you were going to get home and you turn in your assignment so that sense of responsibility and it was actually kind of challenging for me in ways that i had not yeah imagined it would be in short after i came to america i had to grow up So taking things a little more personally, how do you think the perception of homosexuality has differed a little between the US and India? One of my the characters in my books is a gay man who ends up getting married and while I don't want him to be representative of all gay men in India just as I don't want one any of the women in my book to be representative of all women in India it is a fact that I have known many gay men in India who have felt no option but to get married because of social pressures, family pressures, because they just didn't know how to meet other gay men, you know, f- have a lifestyle uh, e- in the way people think of it in the US. You know, those options were just not available. So in in that sense, India is definitely a very different country, but having said that, it's changed dramatically right now there's much more visibility on lesbian gay issues in india you know it's a topic that's discussed in parliament the high court and supreme court have been ruling on it even if it's not always in in favor of the issue and you see it on television you see it on comedy roles bollywood characters are talking about it sometimes they're making fun of it but there are actually some very sensitive portrayals of gay men who that have also happened in bollywood film so culturally there's actually much more uh, viewing and and you get a sense of that in this book as well where my character years later as a middle aged man goes to a, a gay party in a city like Calcutta which is common place now mm-hmm. and that's a lot of that has happened because of the internet uh, it has opened it up and allowed people to find each other yeah. I- in ways they haven't and then they socialize and and they create you know their gay parties and events and things like that and groups and support groups and now cities like Calcutta actually have pride gay pride marches mm-hmm. and I, it sometimes i think that actually um indians in india have become more used to this idea about that there are gay before people would think that oh this gay shay business is just a western thing yeah. it's an american thing it's not an indian thing yeah. and while some of that still persists many indians in india are more used to it than indians who live in america because they are still also sort of stuck in whatever year they immigrated in you know they're like frozen in that 1974 and then that which was a very different india and so i think it's changed the attitudes towards it has changed i mean when the law around homosexuality was um upheld the law that criminalized homosexual sex was upheld by the supreme court almost every english language newspaper in india when the ones i mostly read had an editorial condemning it and so that's quite something yeah that definitely is 
So a lot of Indians are okay with like the whole broad spectrum of things, but what do you think would happen if their own son came up to them and told them that they were gay? Yeah, I mean, there's always the <laughs> not in my backyard problem where yeah. I'm okay with someone else's son being uh, gay. And I mean, obviously I can't generalize for yeah. all of Indians and I, I'm sure a lot of people would be genuinely upset and concerned if and if that happened even if on broadly they don't think homosexuals should be discriminated against but they'd rather it not be their son or daughter yeah. um, having said that even there there is some change happening because when this uh, case was being going on in the supreme court mm -hmm. one of the groups that filed a petition trying to decriminalize homosexuality was actually not gays and lesbians but the parents of gays and lesbians. So a group of parents, in, which included the um, a well-known filmmaker and Chitra Palekar, who was married to the uh, actor filmmaker Amul Palekar, mm -hmm. they and you know all came together and was the mother of a gay man named Nishit Saran, who himself was a young guy who was tragically killed in a car accident in Delhi. But his mother and he he made a documentary about coming out to his mother, and it's kind of very moving because in the documentary you see how shocked. His mother, he filmed the moment of his coming out to his mother and his mother is like really shocked uh, at this. But then after he died, you know, she felt so movingly and strongly about the issue that she joined another group of parents to appeal to the Supreme Court asking them to strike down the issue, even though, of course, it was too late for her own son. So in that sense, even among parents, there, there, is, there is change that's happening. I, I have friends in Delhi um, who a couple, a gay couple, and, uh, you know, he, he told his mother, he said, you know, I don't want to go to family weddings because, you know, when I marry my, if I'm with my partner, nobody will have a wedding for me. Why do I care? So his mother's like, that's right. And this is several years ago. She was like, that's right. And that's very unfair. And then she called the family priest over and then she organized a wedding and the family okay. priest in their room in Delhi. And I remember him always saying, you know, I, can't, I couldn't believe my good fortune, you know, age 30 in my fam parents. Uh, living room yeah. getting married to the man that I wanted to be married and our family priest blessing the occasion so the more it, that doesn't mean all parents are like that yeah. but the more you tell the stories of these parents mm -hmm. the more changes can happen because in the end I always figure you know parents who are upset about their children coming out as gay are not upset out of a sense of hatred but out of a sense of love because they really love their children and they're afraid they're going to have a really hard time in the world as a gay person so they want to protect those children and so once you make people feel like no it's okay you know look there are other parents who are also able to deal with it it just makes it easier for someone else to do it yeah so why don't you talk about some difficulties you had to face when you went back to India when I went back to India, you know, I had lived 20 years in America. So I, in some ways, America seeps into your <laughs> veins in ways that you don't even realize it. And uh, some of the things you think are going to be, you expect, oh, it'll be very noisy or it'll be very hot or, you know, you'll, the pollution will be. So those things you expect, but you know. But all those things, I also grew up in India. So I can't like suddenly pretend that, oh, I've forgotten how hot it, it, it gets <laughs> or I've forgotten how much rain there is during the monsoon. But uh, the difficulties was more actually because I had not really lived in India as an adult, really. I had come here right after being a student. So to go back to India and, you know, these sort of much more American sounding ideas of sense of privacy, <laughs> personal space, you know, this is like in, in America, everyone minds their own business. Yeah. In India, everybody minds your business. <laughs> so you have to get used to that people are just nosy, a lot more nosy. Um, so talk, going back to journalism and different like critiques that are there right now um, in that industry. So as you know, the Charles Hebo, what happened in Paris, um, a lot of criticism came when a journalist just posted something about a like simple topic. What do you think is that defining line between PR and journalism and is there a need to please the public or is a journalist openly okay to say what they feel and how do they, you think they handle that criticism? The most important thing about freedom of speech and freedom of expression is always when you don't agree with what's being said. If I agree with what you're saying, mm -hmm. 
then it's very easy for me to stand up and say, you know, uphold your right <laughs> to say it. But it only becomes important when I vehemently disagree with what you're saying. Yeah. But I still say that in freedom of expression demands that I stand up for your right to say this thing, mm -hmm. even though I oppose your viewpoint. And I think that was the case in Charlie Hebdo, where I personally felt that many of those cartoons that they had were actually racist and needlessly offensive mm -hmm. and not funny at all to me. Yeah. But that doesn't mean anybody had the right to come into the office and gun down those people yeah. in the, you know, saying that they, you have offended it. Yeah, I mean, the problem, and especially now, in, if you move it to the Indian context, mm -hmm. in India, often it seems that the right to get offended routinely trumps the right to be offensive. And freedom of speech includes the right to be offensive. But in India, everyone is like, oh no, such and such person is very offended by what you're saying. So you, there's a ban on your book or there's a ban on your film or there's... So recently there was a comedy skit that happened from this group called AIB and it was a roast which is common in the US sense yeah. where you take a celebrity and you make like fun of them and you make a lot of off-color risky jokes. So these people did it and with film stars in India, you know, they're making jokes about homosexuality, women, dark skin, and all very politically completely incorrect, using a lot of bad language, you know, swear words. When it was put, when clips of it were put up on the internet, they were put with a disclaimer saying that this was used foul language and stuff. But even then, a lot of people were very upset because, you know, we think of these film stars as supposed to be uh, upholding sort of, you know, role models or something. But anyway, who made those film stars role models? You know, <laughs> it was, in, in, in a way, it was honestly refreshing to have a film star talk about another film star and audience and, you know, and their sex life and they live in girlfriends or boyfriends, which everybody knows that so-and-so is together with so-and-so, but everyone sort of pretends that they don't know this <laughs> and that nobody has sex before marriage or in all, all of these things. So in that sense, yeah, of course, the all India, and I didn't find all the jokes on that episode funny. Mm -hmm. Some of them were downright sexist or homophobic. Um, some of them, you know, making jokes about people's education or somebody being fat. Uh, maybe they're not funny at all, but that's the point of a roast, you know, you, you, and that is again goes back to that point where if you, if you take away the right to offend people or right to be offensive and replace it with the right to get offended by everything, then you destroy the very essence of freedom of speech, which is the underpinning of a liberal democracy. Okay, so tying that back into everything, what is, what are some advice you have for journalists out there coming from India and they're trying to make a break in like the media? Ten years, we work for ten <laughs> years in Silicon Valley, and you and you have enough of Follow savings to saving <laughs> enough savings to make the jump. No, I I would say you know like everything else, you have to do the work and you have to so I started I didn't make a break any break in mainstream media mm -hmm. I started out by writing for Indian American publications in the Bay Area they were the only people who would give me the time even if they paid me very little money or sometimes not yeah. at all you wrote for them to get practice to get clips and then with that you you went towards the mainstream media and, and tried to break into that based on that experience and I think there's no shortcut to it you know that you have have to do put in the time put in the effort it's not like you can just walk into the doors of mainstream media and say like hey you know I'm, I'm very special and and I think too many people think that that is going to happen but also the other thing to remember now is that you don't have to think of the mainstream media in the limited way we thought of it before that oh if you're in the Bay Area that means San Jose Mercury News or the San Francisco Chronicle or particular television channels a lot of the in ethnic media, a lot of blogs, you know, a lot of online portals are all actually becoming very much part of the media landscape. And so you should, you should try and, and get into a lot of those other things instead of just focusing on what was once traditionally called mainstream media. Yeah. Thank you so much again, Cindy, for coming out and talking about your book. Would you like to end by reading an excerpt from it? Sure, I'll read a little bit from it. I'll read a little section perhaps that's uh, set in, uh, in California. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it, it's in a place where my character, Romola, who is in a suburb of California, much like the one we are sitting in right <laughs> now, and she's a little bored. 
Yeah. And one day she decides that uh, she wants to get out of the house and sneak away and uh, perhaps go to a McDonald's because she wants to have a real <laughs> burger. And so she goes to this McDonald's and I'll read this little section and, and the girl there says, Can I help you? Her bored voice sounded anything but helpful. Romola nodded and then took the plunge. She pointed at a burger on the menu but could not say anything. A burger, that one, she pointed at the menu. With cheese or without, said the girl, as if reading from a script. Romola shook her head. The girl looked at her quizzically and then went on to her next line. The meal or just the sandwich? Just the sandwich? Romola had a little more confidence in her voice. Will that be all? Romola nodded. For here to go, said the girl. Romola stared at her, baffled. This was not a line she knew. There was nothing like that in the <laughs> script she had carefully rehearsed in her head. For here to go, said the girl again. Romola suddenly became aware of other people in the restaurant. She craned forward, nervously clutching her half-open bag. The girl was still looking at her, so was the man standing next to her. Yes, she said, hoping that was the right answer. For here to go, said the girl again, as if demanding a secret password. And Romola lost her nerve. Grabbing the handbag to her chest, she suddenly turned around and started walking as fast as she could towards the door. The girl said something else behind her back, but she refused to turn around and face that counter again. She walked past the trash can, its flap swinging as someone emptied their tray in it. She waited for someone to grab, grab her and turn her around and frog march her back to the counter. But no one seemed to even notice that she was there anymore. Her little order had sunk without a trace, like a stone in the pond, and life went on with not even a ripple to show for its brief flickering existence. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>